Singapore is now in a new phase. We're making, we're heading in a new direction. We're making strategic shifts. I set out some of these strategic shifts at the National Day Rally, which was in fact here a month plus ago. Giving everybody a share in Singapore's success, strengthening our social safety nets, keeping our society open and mobile. The next step beyond articulating these priorities is to translate the shifts into policies and to implement programs that improve people's lives. And to do that, we need a good public service and we need good PSLs, public service leaders. And therefore, today's PSL advance to discuss how the public service should gear itself up for the future and what your role as PSLs should be to make this happen. One major determinant of our success will be trust. In other words, trust in the government. Trust that the government understands Singaporeans' needs, trust that the government is committed to Singaporeans, and trust that the government will remain a steward for the public good. How can the public service work to strengthen this trust? It needs to do so by working together as one public service with Singaporeans at the center of what they do. And it needs to do so by upholding the highest standards of integrity. Let me take them one at a time. The public service has to operate as one integrated whole, fully committed to improving Singaporeans' lives. Our policies have to change with time to keep up with changing aspirations and needs. Our organization also has to change with time to provide Singaporeans with a seamless, functional service. And so we are adapting the structure of our government to meet these new needs as they arise, creating new agencies like MCCY, a new ministry, or like the Early Childhood Development Agency, ECDA, to address new priorities, create new focus areas. Ideally, of course, we have one agency per focus area, and one job belongs to one agency. Then education goes to MOE, social issues go to MSF. The agency has a clear focus, the problems get the appropriate attention. But reality is always messier than that. And issues nowadays increasingly straddle multiple agencies because they are inherently complex and interrelated. It's so if you're handling climate change, it's so if you're dealing with population, it's so if you're trying to, ro trying to create economic transformation. And ditto for our new priorities. If you're talking about uplifting the poor, that's not just a responsibility for the MSF. MOE is involved educating the children of poor families. MOM is involved looking after low-income workers. MND is involved making sure that housing is affordable and gives a boost, especially at the lower income. Multiple agencies have to come together in order to achieve a single objective. And we can't put all these into one ministry for the poor. Likewise, MediShield Life, including MOH, of course, but also MOF, which must decide how much money we can spend, how to spend it, how to fund it. MSF, what do you do with families which may not be able to afford the premiums when the premiums go up, and so on. So the service has to be adapted, focused on the priorities, but at the same time able to work across the whole service and bring attention to bear onto one multifaceted problem from many directions. And we have to be able to work seamlessly across agencies and with one another. Taking the customer's perspective and not just your own agency's view and implementing policies well. So to start off with, the civil service has to work seamlessly across multiple agencies. Whatever your internal organization, 
whatever our internal organization, whatever our division of responsibilities, we have to present a seamless and a coherent experience to the people. Our complexities should be transparent to them. Because it's frustrating for the public to deal with multiple agencies and conflicting policies. And over time, the public will lose trust in the service if it can't figure this out. Even for us figuring out which agency is responsible for which job and which problem and who is to take the lead, we need a lot of argy-bargy and organization and discussion. What more somebody from outside the system coming in, trying to find his way around. I just give you one not so very serious but rather telling example. Animal issues. In this case, the animal is a snake. Somebody called NEA to report that he had spotted a snake near the Tanglin International Center. Right? This is a real story. So the NEA officer asked him, was the snake in a public park or in the building? Caller says, no, it was near the building. Was it moving towards the building or away? <laughs> Toward the stairs of the building. Where is it now? I don't know. I was so scared I ran away. <laughs> I need to know where the snake is so I can escalate this to the right agency. But I ran away. Okay, sir, I'll take care of it. So the officer put down the phone, called someone else to catch the snake. There was a trainee listening into the conversation and asked the officer why she had so many questions. The officer says, depending on the location of the snake, different government agencies may be involved. If it's in a park, it could be end parks. If it's in a drain, that's PUB. If it's endangered, that's AVA. And if it is dangerous, then we may call the police. <laughs> so the trainee asked, whom did you call to settle the matter? The officer said, Acres. <laughs> None of the above. Acres, for those of you who are not familiar, is the Animal Welfare Group. It's an NGO. So snakes are complicated problems. I think birds used to be equally complicated problems. It depended whether it was a crow or not, which agency was responsible for it. But the service has sorted this particular problem out. And now AVA fronts all animal issues. And there's one animal number for the public to call. 1-800-476-1600. So, so we've made some progress but I think we can do somewhat more in other areas. Licensing startups involves multiple chops. Integrating agency master plans is also a complex matter. And we must be able to put this all together and make it seamless to the public and be, function as one civil service. Secondly, we need to be customer oriented. We have to see things from the perspectives of those we are serving, those who are on the receiving end when we make and carry out policies. We have to understand the realities on the ground to identify and solve problems before they become serious, not discover them too late. And this is very difficult to do. We can't, you can't take every comment at face value, you cannot exceed to every appeal. It's your job to listen, judge, and decide. And you have to distinguish between requests which are valid and should be met, and complaints which are self-serving or unjustified and sh must not be accommodated. You also have the opposite problem. The opposite problem is when you are the regulator in the government agency, and the group that you are regulating doesn't want to offend you and doesn't want to offend the powers that be. It happens with all regulator-regulated relationships. MAS is in this position, URA, BCA, many others. Then trying to get candid, valuable feedback becomes difficult 
because the person who's regulated doesn't want to offend the regulator and will not tell you the honest truth, even when he's not happy, even when things are not going well. And you've got to go that extra mile to build the trust, to get people to open up and to tell you what is really happening. Then you can make up your mind what you need to do based on facts, based on reality, based on what is really working or not working on the ground. It's not easy, but I'm glad to see that the agencies are making an effort to do this. For example, MAS and IE Singapore have been amending the Securities and Futures Act and the Commodities Trading Act to bring our regulations on commodity derivatives trading into line with international standards. It's an abstruse subject, but it involves a community of traders, of businesses out there, and you have to get the rules right. So MAS and IE have been engaging companies through roundtables to understand their concerns and to clarify the new regulatory framework. And they took pains to reassure companies that they genuinely wanted to hear their views and wanted honest views. And the efforts did work because the companies provided IE and MAS with useful feedback that helped them to refine their thinking on the regulations. And the companies felt that they had been given a fair hearing and they were more prepared to work with the agencies to develop and refine the rules together. And so it's important for you to know what the ground thinks, what the ground needs, and to be responsive in solving problems that people or that businesses encounter. But at the same time, you must uphold our national interests, our wider common good. You cannot be captured by special interest groups. You cannot be captured by the group you are regulating. You cannot be captured by your own bureaucratic perspective. You have got to try to maintain a national perspective and solve things which make sense from an overall Singapore point of view. If the policy is not working, fix it. If the policy is painful but necessary, like tightening foreign worker inflows is making it very painful for some businesses, then you've got to find ways to mitigate the downsides, communicate our intent, fine-tune the policies, smooth off the rough edges wherever possible, but hold our ground on the core of the policies. So that's in terms of policies. But policies are on paper unless they're implemented well. Policy ultimately is implementation. It's what happens which counts. And if it's not translated into specific programs and well carried out, it will just remain a piece of paper. And you've, when you've got it implemented, you also have to monitor the trends and the results carefully so you know when we have to change our approach. And you've got to take special care in the cases where you have outsourced the policy or the implementation because you haven't really outsourced the responsibility or the problem. You must make sure that whoever is the outsourced vendor implements it properly and have a proper system, whether it's service level agreements, whether it's monitoring, whether it's some cross-checking, to know that it's outsourced doesn't mean out of sight, out of mind. Take one example where implementation is going to be a challenge, MediShield Life. Everybody supports the principle, but implementation is going to involve many trade-offs. Higher premiums versus coverage. Subsidies for elder population versus low-income families. You have to choose. It is not, you cannot make perfect ideal schemes. We have to make compromises and we must decide what is workable, what achieves the main objective of MediShield life. And we've got to work out the details carefully and get them right so that the final result is a positive one. And that's why MOH is taking the time to consult the public, engage insurance companies, and work out the specific details. And in the process, have the public educated so that when we implement it, it achieves its objective. As PSLs, 
you, pay, you play important roles in these issues. You've got to further hold of government priorities, not just look at it from your department's point of view. You've got to engage the public and stakeholders. You've got to design and implement well thought out schemes to achieve the policy intent. And it's because you must have that feel to go beyond principles and statements that we have broadened our PSL team in the civil service to include domain experts and professional leaders in specific centers, sectors. And that's why today for PSL Advance, we have people from across the civil service, from the stat boards, from the people who are responsible for specific agencies so that you understand how you fit in and what your role will be. When you have the implementation worked out, the implementation where, as the Americans say, the rubber meets the road, is done through service delivery. You may not be delivering the service yourself because direct contact with the public is often done by mid-level and junior staff. But as, as PSLs, you have to take responsibility because many of you head frontline agencies. And the daily contact with the public is intense. ICA has half a million people at the checkpoints daily. The hospitals have 30,000 patients come in, outpatients, inpatients. As a whole, in one quarter, the second quarter this year, the government received 1.6 million emails, phone calls, and letters. One every five seconds. So, the frontline job is intense, is important, it's also very hard. Public expectations are rising. You give a reply, you can't wait and then send a letter. You receive an email, they expect a response within 24 hours. You give a negative reply, it is unlikely to be the last word. There will be appeals, there will be further argy-bargy before the matter is settled. MPs see this at our Meet the People sessions too. We see fewer cases than the frontline staff, maybe 50 or 100 a week. But still, we sense the same expectations, the same pressures, the same desire to have that problem solved. And to the person who is facing the problem, every problem is urgent. Citizens will form their impressions of the government from their experience with frontline services. And one unhappy encounter can color perceptions for a long time. So the frontline job is important, it's tough, it's done by junior officers. Some of them have been doing it for years. I think they are doing good work and would, I'd like to thank them for their hard work and for their dogged, determined, overall high quality service. As PSLs, your job is to pay personal attention to service quality and not just to high policy. Train and develop your frontline staff. Demand high standards from them and give them the resources to achieve these standards. Back them up with information, with support, with decisions when decisions are called, with moral backing when they need encouragement and when they come under pressure. Inspire them to give of their best, but stand up for them when they need you to be with them. We expect public officers to be courteous and respectful. We also expect the same of the public who come to deal in our government ministries and stand boards. Of course, if appeals fail, or if there's poor service, people will be unhappy, will be disappointed. But I think that there is a certain basic courtesy which is expected when a, official, when a counter staff meets a member of the public. And it is unacceptable to make unreasonable demands of the staff down there when things don't go your own way. Unfortunately, such cases do happen. You have, there are many examples, so we've cited some of them, but 
if you take just one conspicuous area, you have motorists who, are, who have been called over for traffic violations. They get angry. They abuse the officers. Particularly, these are not the police officers themselves, but certain Cisco officers engaged by LTA and URA to enforce parking violations, traffic violations. And I think that this is not acceptable. There has to be courtesy, there has to be correctness. And if anybody abuses government officers who are doing their duty properly, we have to take action against that. The government officer must behave properly, so too must the members of the public. Improving policies and service quality will enhance trust in the government because it shows that the service understands Singaporeans' concerns and is on their side. And it will encourage Singaporeans to work with the government, with the service, and support our programs, and we can achieve our goals together. And that is what it means when we say the public service has to act as one with Singaporeans at the center. Also critical to maintaining public trust is upholding the highest standards of integrity. It's something which we have built up and maintained painstakingly over many, many years. It's the basic genetic code that enables our whole system to work. Because there's integrity in our public service, therefore businesses can compete fairly instead of relying on improper influence. Therefore, public officers can have the discretion and the authority to manage huge projects, use, exercising their judgment and their knowledge, instead of going strictly by formulas which may or may, may not fit the needs of the job. We trust them, we empower them, we hold them to account. And Singaporeans know that the doors are open. If they work hard, even if they don't have family backgrounds or personal connections, they can make it. It does not depend on Kwan Si. And so, when MM, ex MM celebrated his 90th birthday and we gave him a little party in Parliament, he spoke for a few minutes and only one 90th birthday wish that Singapore government continues to be clean and honest, and to uphold the highest moral standard. And the ministers and the MPs have to set the example and maintain that standard themselves. It's the critical factor which enables our whole system to work and enables us to be different from so many other countries in the world, especially so many other countries in Asia. One reason we've been able to maintain a clean system is pay. We pay public servants properly, in line with the quality of the officers and the value of their contributions, and we will continue to maintain this policy. But in return, we insist on high standards of performance and integrity. And if an officer is discovered to have been dishonest, then we will punish him to the full extent of the law, and we will maintain this principle too even when it is embarrassing to the government. It's more important than ever for us to maintain a clean system in Singapore. The public service is bigger, the job is more complex. We have more transactions, bigger sums are involved. The span of control is wider. We need to decentralize our organization, to devolve authority, so that officers can respond more quickly and appropriately and flexibly to needs on the ground. But at the same time, we have to complement this with central oversight, with proper procedures, with effective but not stifling checks and balances. This last year has seen a string of high-profile cases including public, involving public officers, including some senior ones. We've had sex for favors scandals. We've had procurement lapses. We've had fraud cases uncovered, prosecuted, dealt with in the public. Each case 
has been widely reported, and taking together, they raise the question whether there's something fundamentally wrong with the service. We have reviewed this in depth. Overall, I think the trend for cases has not worsened. Public sector cases still make up about one-fifth of total corruption cases in Singapore, about the same as it used to be. But every single case involving a public servant and public money is one case too many. In the case, in the incidents which have come up this last year, in each case we've identified the causes, the lapses, we've fixed them. Where it's due to the negligence of officers, we've disciplined the officers who should have performed their duties more seriously. Where weaknesses in processes were found, we've tightened up the processes. And sometimes we have, we've extrapolated to tighten up further to deal with future problems. And you've heard some of the new rules in the briefing this morning. Where there have been criminal acts, we've taken legal and disciplinary action against the culprits to punish them and to deter others. But beyond these individual cases and the individual actions we are taking, we have to strengthen our system to uphold the reputation for integrity and incorruptibility and to dispel any doubts that our standards have gone down. So we are tightening up rules on, and compliance to ensure probity without miring ourselves in bureaucracy. We are learning best practices from other large organizations, be it civil services, be it international organizations, or be it multinational corporations. Other organizations face the same challenges we do. How to keep the system straight, how to keep people doing the right thing in the organization, how to detect and deter rogue behavior. I think we can pick up ideas from them. And we can use technology to minimize abuse too. Mine data for irregular, irregularities, install digital safeguards. Nearly everything is on the computer. If something is happening off the computer, we, want, we will also want to know why. And I'm glad the public service is doing this, teaching the code of conduct, tightening the IMs on procurement, introducing new regulations on casino visits. We have to continue adjusting, adapting our rules and keeping abreast of the new needs and circumstances. But ultimately, integrity is not about systems and processes, but values. The government must have a culture that doesn't tolerate any wrongdoing or dishonesty. And the public officers must have the right values, service, integrity, excellence, as the civil service puts it. And each officer and the service as a whole must take pride in being clean, in being incorrupt. This is your command responsibility. You cannot devolve it to your subordinates. You cannot leave it to your procurement or your financial officers. You are the boss. You are in charge. You have to make sure that it's happening well in your organization. Take the lead yourself to put in place the right systems, to enforce the rules fairly and firmly, to deal with mistakes decisively and openly, and most importantly, to lead by example. Model the right values for your staff. To know the way, go the way, show the way. Trust is essential for the government to operate because without basic trust in the government, none of our plans can make it off the paper and be realized. There will be no end to the demands for more reviews or doubts about whether a policy is to benefit those with connections rather than the public good. And trust is especially necessary when the government has to make difficult or unpopular decisions, whether it's restructuring agent, uh, industries or raising public transport fares, which in government will happen and the government has to do from time to time. 
And that is also why the government takes a firm stance to protect our integrity of the system and of the key persons against unfounded attacks. If attacks are made, they are either correct, in which case something serious must happen, or they are baseless, in which case they have to be challenged, because otherwise it will slowly erode the trust and integrity of the public service and of the government. I am proud of this public service. I think every civil servant in Singapore should stand tall and be proud of what we are doing. We have passionate public officers, we are committed to serve, and we are doing right things for Singapore and for Singaporeans. By any international standard, we have an outstanding public service. But by Singapore standards, we continue to demand that you do better. And how the public perceives the civil service is in your hands because it will emerge from the daily interactions with public officers in the way you exemplify the public service values of integrity, service, and excellence. So I look forward to continuing to working with all of you, all your ministries and agencies, to forge our new way forward and to build a better Singapore with an outstanding public service. Thank you very much.